Um, today, it's interesting that uh, Belinda just said sometimes you've got to step out of your comfort zone because this is going to be possibly a bit uncomfortable for some people to sit through um, because you'll be sitting there going, he's talking to me, I know he is, but I'm really not. So if you're thinking that, then that's your stuff, not, not mine, but we'll, we'll get there anyway, right? So my name is Nick Bowditch. I'm at Nick Bowditch across all the socials. You can find me anywhere you want at that unimaginative tag. Um, today, my aim is for you to think differently about just one thing. I don't know what that one thing is, but if I can spend this 45 minutes banging on to make you actually change how you think about something, hopefully how you think about yourself, then, then that's a win for me. Story is big for me. I think about story a lot because a lot of the stories we tell are either not very kind to ourselves or there's somebody else's story of ourselves, our partner, our mum, our kids, our teachers, whoever, right? Or, or a story that we don't think we can manipulate. You know, uh, the story is, I grew up in this dysfunctional family, and so I've made a dysfunctional family, and I just have to survive that because that's my story. Um, I was told, that not, this is not me necessarily or any of you, but you know, I was told in year nine I was dumb, and so I'm dumb, and so everything else I've ever achieved is an accident, and I'll just have to take the best I can get, right? These stories ruminate around us a lot. Some people are born with the story that, actually, I'm pretty rad. I'm pretty lucky. You know, everything I've got is, is, is because of my hard work and my talent, and I, I welcome all that good stuff happening to me. Not very often, but some people's story is that. I think that's the hundred, and the I'm dumb and crap is zero, and what I'd like you to aim at is somewhere in the middle of that, to be able to regulate that story and, and propel yourself forward. And, um, I used to work at a couple of big brands, I worked at Facebook and I worked at Twitter, I used to run small business and startup marketing for Facebook for a few years, and then, uh, then I've worked my way back into my own business now where I do a little bit of business coaching, um, but primar primarily because I've, I've um, since been qualified in my psych training as well, and counselling now, so a lot of what I do is counselling work with people who have either addicts or have addiction in their family or in their own selves, or people with unresolved childhood traumas. That's kind of my two specialties. Pretty cheery stuff. These are the things that somebody else will tell me are my character defects, are the things that are wrong with me. But me, like you, nothing wrong with me. Nothing wrong about me. I am me. So with all this or without it, it's still who I am. And I can think of these things as being my character defects or I can accept that these things are my superpowers. They are the things that absolutely make me superhuman. Yeah. That I'm superhuman, baby. And if you're sitting there with some of those things, going on for you, and guess what? So are you. It's the recognition of those superpowers instead of the acceptance that something is wrong that turns everything around, that reframes my story from these things being a defect to these things being a superpower. Because of my mental health, I have great empathy for people. I'm really good at empathy. Because of it, I understand human connection. I understand human connection because it, it has literally saved my life. To be able to reach out to someone when I was going to end my life and for someone to connect with me and go, maybe not today. So, let me ask you, what are your superpowers? What are the things that either you tell yourself or somebody tells you, that's, that's something that's wrong with you. That annoys me, that, you need to change that, right? And but Which you can think about now and go, actually, that's one of the reasons I'm pretty rad, right? People say about me that I am too loud and I'm too opinionated, both of which, absolutely right. And that's the negative side of it. If I think of that in a superpower version, it's like, yeah, okay, I'm too loud and I'm too opinionated, but I'm heard... Right? And, and everybody knows how I feel about something. You don't get surprised. I don't passively, aggressively abuse you later. Like, you, if you know me, you know me. 
So it's absolutely a superpower of mine. So what are yours? Can you see how you, that reframing is important? You retake your story from somebody else. From the teacher who said you were dumb in year nine, you take that back and say, everyone's dumb in year nine. <laughs> right? Thank Look you. to those people who share. So we're going to start with what holds us back. Right? And then I'm going to end with a positive note. Don't worry, we'll, we'll work on what, what shoots us forward. But there's three things that hold us back. Number one is fear. I've already heard it mentioned a couple of times by Belinda and other, other presenters. Fear sucks. Fear is never our own. It's never our own. And I'm not talking about fear like, like normal fear, like spiders and clowns, like everyone should be fearful of them. That's weird. I'm talking about the stuff that really holds you back because, because you believe it to be true. It's a core belief of yours. And the majority of those fears come from an interpersonal relationship with somebody else who's created that fear in us. We don't, we're not instinctively fearful of not being able to run a business, or not being able to start a business, not being able to put ourselves out there as a Renault consultant, not being able to flip something, not being able to apply our own taste. That's not something we instinctively have. That's the school teacher in year nine, or your mum, or your husband, or your wife, or your kids, or your friends, who say, don't get too out of yourself, mate. You know, you know they're good. Right? And the reason somebody says that is, they don't want you overtaking them. Nobody wants to be overtaken. You know, you say, I'm going to start this reno business. I guarantee one person in your life will go, oh, are you sure? It's a bit risky. <laughs> right? Translation, don't be better than me. Because I've already got my story of you. Don't, don't change that. Right? Fear sucks and it's always about somebody else. Can you see how yes. it's always somebody else's story, right? Yeah, sure. Your mum or someone in your life says, this is what you've got to do. You've got to leave school. You've got to get married. You've got to have babies. You've got to blah, 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 whatever it is. Who knows? You can't apply any kind of creativity or do anything you want to do. You, the story's already written. And then when you decide or someone tells you, Belinda tells you, you can do something else, you're like, oh, I don't think so. That's not my story. I get off here, uh, 45 seconds before I get on stage every single time. It, the record starts playing in my head. It says, today's the day. They'll work out, you don't know what you're talking about. You're a fraud, you're an imposter, you're this, you're that. They, they know it, today's the day. Every single time. And yet, I keep getting booked to do it, so obviously you don't know that I'm a fraud. So. <laughs> but fear sucks, and it's always about somebody else. If we can think of that, you can start to pull it apart and maybe get past it. The only fear in your head has been put there by somebody who is not in this room. Otherwise, you'd, you know, you wouldn't be, it wouldn't be in your head. It only comes from other people booing from the cheap seats. Secondly, criticism holds us back. <laughs> Again, somebody else's stuff, not ours. Um, I never, I, I really support you never to listen to anyone who is covering their own fear by attacking you for having your own curiosity. They're fearful that you're going to overtake them. They're fearful that you're going to leave them. They're fearful that you're going to work out you, you're more than that and you won't need them anymore. They're terribly fearful of that, so they'll tell you, this Renault stuff's a bit, bit sus, a bit risky. Are you sure? It's a depression, it's a recession, you're no good, whatever rubbish they tell you. But I'm not listening to anyone who isn't in the arena having a crack. I'm just not. If that person in your life is not sitting in this room, putting yourself out there and having a crack, then I'm sorry, they don't get, a, they don't get an opinion. And if you give them one, then you're the goose. If you let other people judge your life without ever having stepped in your shoes, then sorry, it's up to you. There is no creativity without vulnerability. You can't create anything without first going, oh, I'm going to put this out there and say this is mine. 
I'm going to redo the front of those houses and I'm going to, you know, the, the, fa- the um, street appeal thing that we were talking about before and I'm going to put my stamp on that and ev- everyone's going to know that that's what I did. I'm going to write a book about my abuse and how I live with my abuse every day and how I deal with my mental health and I'm going to put that out there. Can you imagine that week in my head? <laughs> but unless you make yourself vulnerable, you can't make yourself creative either. People who will never, ever, ever put themselves out there and flip a house or start a reno business or be a consultant or offer themselves to the world, it's really easy for them to tell you how crap you are. Really easy. And if you don't think that's true, look at Twitter. The third thing then is, am I enough? Ugh. Kicks me in the guts every time I say that sentence. Because this is one of the things that we mostly struggle with, you know, The thing that says to me 45 seconds before I come on, (laughs) they're going to find out today. It's today. You know, the imposter syndrome. Who else sort of feels that in in some part of their life? Yeah, a lot of people, right? So this is how I try not to feel it. The first thing is, I don't try to be perfect. (laughs) I just try to add value. Perfection is impossible. Being valuable is very possible, right? So that's, what I, that's what the first thing I am at to try and stop that horrible fraudster thing. The second thing is I stop comparing myself to other people as much as I can. I do not care what anybody else does up here. I do not care what anybody else's website looks like. I do not care what anybody else charges as an hourly rate, Right? I charge what I charge and there's a reason for that and I'm happy with it and it's going to stay. I keep a nice file. This is going to sound a little bit narcissistic but when someone tweets something nice about me or puts something on Instagram nice about me or they might have read my book and they might say something nice about the book or they might have seen me at an event and said something nice about my speaking. I screenshot that <laughs> and I put it in a Google Drive in a folder marked my nice file. And on the days where I'm really mad, and, and it's, there's a lot of stuff in here that's not that great, and a lot of it says, you're shit, then I look at that nice file, all this unsolicited stuff that people have said about me that I haven't asked them to say, but it must be true. Why would they say it if it wasn't true, right? And then I can go, oh, I'm not that bad. You know, and it's a really empowering thing to have a nice file. I really support you to start one for yourself. And the last thing is, I just think you should just have a crack because nobody knows what they're doing anyway. (laughs) Truly. So what propels us forward then? What's the good stuff? Right? Because that's a lot of negative stuff I've already covered. So let's think about what, going forward, what, what helps us. And the first one is to focus on what is true. I talked about fear before being somebody else's stuff for you and someone else's story and all of that. None of that is true. If you start a sentence with, I think she thinks dot, 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 that's not true. If you start a sentence with, well, I heard he said, that's not true. If you heard it, it's true, right, and we can deal with that. But the first thing I really want to focus, want you guys to remember to focus on when you start to feel that horrible doubt and fear in your life, in your professional life or your personal life. Number one, is it real? Is this something I can tangibly say it's absolutely real? Because if the answer is no, then I give myself permission to let that feeling go. I've got enough crazy without adding stuff that's not real. As well, if I start telling people there's stuff that's not real in my head as well, they definitely will lock me up. So, number one, is it real? Two, can I change it? So, yes, okay, the first thing is real. You did hear that person say that or you have whatever. Second then is, can you change it? Can you change that they said it? Can you change that they think that? Can can you change someone's opinion of you that doesn't know you and he's booing from a cheap seat? If the answer is no then I give myself permission to let that feeling go. But if it's yes, 
I go to the third most important question, which is, does it matter anyway? Hurt my feelings. Then I apply the last question, and it's a little virtual uppercut that I give myself, and I go, well, do I care? Does it matter? If somebody says something about you in the market, something, somebody says something about you about starting this business or about some flip you've done or about your reno ability or your taste or whatever, is it real? Can I change it? Does it matter anyway? The application of those three sentences has saved me so much pain in my life since I started to apply it and, and, and my clients' pain as well, since I started to say to them, listen, is that real? And I say to Belinda constantly, where's the data for that? She'll say to me an, an opinion she has or a feeling she has about the market or about something. And I said, well, where's the data for that? Where's, show me. Show me that that's real. And if she can't, then we let it go. I know that sounds simplistic, but there's a reason for that. It bloody is. Marketing. But being you is, is the most important part of the lot. Because nobody else in this room can do that. Warts and all. Nobody can get up and tell my story. They could, but they'd probably leave pieces out and they probably don't really know what it's like to live with all that madness and stuff in in my life life experience. Likewise, you, whatever your story is, get up and tell it loud and proud. Something that helps in marketing, like in all the marketing that I've ever done with my small businesses or, or other people who I've worked with, is to remember these three things. To tell the story how it was, how we changed it, and how it is now. A lot of people just get stuck on this middle one. This is what I'm doing to this property. Right? Without going, well, this is what it looked like. This is what I'm doing, and this is what it's going to look like. Like to be able to use Chris's, Chris's designs, you know, to be able to say, this is a SketchUp version of it, this is the horrible thing I've stepped into on day one and this is where we're at now. That's a really powerful bit of storytelling if you can concentrate on those three things. Weapon. The secret weapon to winning business, to winning marketing, to winning a business transformation or even your own consultancy business or your own renos. And it's something that we used to use all the time in business and interpersonal stuff and we've kind of gone away from it. But it's something that's really, really powerful and it's kindness. You are never going to lose business by being kind. You'll only ever gain it. Nobody goes into a business and goes, oh, I can't stand how kind that chick is. God, it shits me. <laughs> right? Nobody's ever going to say that. And if you're, the more and more you're kind, the more and more it's an instinctive thing that you don't have to try to be. And people love it. Who doesn't love it? Who doesn't love someone being kind to them? Right? And that can be through your personal or professional lives. It's really, really important, simple little adjustment you can make to include more kindness. I always finish with this question. What would you do if you weren't afraid? We talked about fear before and how crap it is and how it's always somebody else's story. And the only way you can let that go is by letting it go. Is by saying, I am scared. Oh, but I'm going to do it anyway. I do feel like an imposter, God bless you, but I'm going to do it anyway. I do feel like I don't know everything yet, so I'm going to find out, get some help from Blinder and other people and the, and the Accelerator Girls and whatever, and I'm going to get that done. So I want to really challenge you with this today. What would you do if you weren't afraid? When you walk out of here today after two days of an amazing conference, which has surely sown some seeds in your mind of what you can and can't do, if you're still sitting there fearful, which is totally fine, except if it stops you from doing something that you want to do, what would you do today if you weren't afraid? All right, so I want you to take that with you today, right? What would you do if you weren't afraid? And remembering that all fear... All fear in our life is somebody else's insertion. Somebody else you've let in from the cheap seats to make you afraid. And only you can evict them.